Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you all for coming, and welcome to DIA. My name is Matilde Guidali. I'm DIA's Associate Curator, and I'm delighted to introduce today's event. But before diving in, I wish to thank everyone at DIA who helped making this possible, in particular, Emily Markert, Kim Golding, and Max Tannon. I had the great pleasure of being in conversation with Leslie Hewitt now for almost three years on and towards her beautiful project with DIA, which takes its starting point in a year-long exhibition at DIA Bridgehampton, the Dunflavin Art Institute, which is open until June 4th, and I encourage you all to visit if you have not had a chance yet. In a sequence of invitations, Leslie in turn involved a number of artists, musicians, and thinkers to decenter the exhibition and open up dialogue among different practices and epistemologies. Artist Jamal Cyrus has joined Leslie in realizing one of the works in the exhibition, consisting of a score for performance, riffing on the convention of the still life genre, to be imagined in conjunction with Thelonious Monk's song, Evidence, and to be interpreted by solo instruments in the register of practice. The first interpretation by pianist Jason Moran took place at the Village Vanguard in November. Coming next is Emmanuel Wilkins, alto saxophonist, here at DHLC on March 5th. And finally, Rashida Bambray will interpret the score through movement and tambourine on Sunday, May 14th. The sculptures that Leslie realized for her exhibition and the project as a whole conceptually call upon the inspiring scholarship of Tiffany Lethabo King, and we are very, very grateful that Tiffany accepted our invitation to join us today in this at once expanded and intimately connected context. Tiffany Lethabo King holds the Barbara and John Glynn Research Professorship in Democracy and Equity and is Associate Professor in the Women, Gender and Sexuality Studies Department at the University of Virginia. Her influential book, The Black Shoals, Offshore, Form Offshore Formations of Black and Native Studies, uh, which came out in 2020 with Duke University Press, takes the shawl as a metaphor to theorize the coming together of black and native studies. Shoals are shifting, shifting sandbars formed and reformed by the interaction of land and sea, domains of the distinct in scholarship with the oceanic space as a space for black thought and land as a space for native thought. Shoals are disruptive as they are unmappable they slow down settler conquest and worldview. In fact, a cursory search in the dictionary defines them as sites of danger because of shipwrecks. As a meeting space to radically rethink where our boundaries are, the shoal shifts and moves, encouraging not to rest on historical accounts or resolutions. It is a space of radical connectivity that demands readiness. Um, Tiffany's book is not only brilliant, but also beautifully written among its many contributions from a methodological standpoint, it redefines deconstruction. Tiffany's close reading of documents, techniques, and theories is close because it's always intimate and the deconstruction is always collective. Alongside scholarship, poetry and visual arts are partners in her endeavor and the networks to, that sustain her are also celebrated here. Today, um, Tiffany will pr present new research, followed by an exchange with Leslie and a Q&A session, and we warmly encourage your questions. So thank you so much, Tiffany, for being with us today, and without further ado, please join me in welcoming Tiffany Lethabo King. Good afternoon, folks. I think I can make out shapes of people. I hope you're well. All right, Matilde, thank you so much for your introduction. It's um, always so interesting to hear how people experience the work. Thank you for the care you've shown it and for this invitation and the invitation to be in conversation uh, and meet Leslie. Leslie, thank you for inviting me to be a thought partner in your Sunday matinee and um, your collective archiving process, the expansive sensorium you're creating. And it's particularly meaningful to me because I'm not sure if you know, but I think 
you contacted me a few weeks after my mother passed away and I was really, really, really looking for another expressive mode. And so this invitation, particularly to work in this register of practice is what I needed. I'm still trying things on and so it's been incredibly meaningful and a healing balm to be engaged in these creative ceremonies with you. So really appreciate that. Also, thank you, Max, Kim, uh, the staff at DIA. I don't know if Emily's here, but um, I appreciate you getting me so close to the uh, gallery space and the more is quite comfortable and also what I need. I'm not a New Yorker. I, uh, <laughs> I struggle. I just really am overstimulated. So I need some really direct roots. And the extent to which I am not a New Yorker is evident in the fact that um, when I went to visit your exhibit, Leslie, I did not realize I was coming to this place called the Hamptons <laughs> until my partner was like, oh, we're going to the Hamptons. I was like, oh, Bridge Hampton is a part of the Hamptons. <laughs> I tend to really hyper-localize and just focus on the blocks I need to be on in the place. So I was in the Hamptons for the first time. Um, when I got to uh, visit your work in December. And um, when we actually went, when I went, I traveled with um, the culinary artist and writer Sharon P. Holland who made Mathilde, uh, Leslie, Ashana who's here, and Sarah Emile. So we got to talk about family origins. Uh, migrations, some of the geological formations that animate both of our uh, work and research and creative processes, and I really value that. So I'm going to do some reading. I'm going to talk about some of the images um, that I have to share with you today, and then we'll engage each other. So for those um, of you who do not know, get comfortable. Leslie Hewitt read my book, The Black Shoals, and invited me to be in a conversation about a number of themes that the installation at Dia Bridge Hampton takes up. And in my book, I travel with the metaphor of the shoal, a geological formation that is both water and land, as Mathilde described. Um, it's an ecotonal space that is an in-between space. And a shoal is often experienced as a sandbar offshore, a coral reef that slows movement in the ocean. And so, um, as Leslie was talking about, ships often found shoals to be treacherous spaces. It could actually uh, sink a ship, right? So spaces of danger and sometimes um, unknown sunken spaces in the ocean. And I primarily worked with this uh, geological formation as a geography and metaphor that brings together the often sequestered native geographies of land and black geographies of the ocean. And I talked about the shoal as a place where the ocean floor kisses the water. And for folks who are not familiar with my work, what I do, I think the, the core of my scholarly labor is to look for intimacy uh, between black and indigenous people. And the kinds of intimacies that I attend to uh, include historical revolutionary solidarities, romance, conflict, which also produces its own intimacy, conceptual and theoretical entanglements, methodological and artistic affinities, overlapping material and performative cultures, as well as imagined and hoped for black and indigenous alliances. Recently, I've taken on the role of co-director of the Black and Indigenous Feminist Futures Institute at UVA. At the Institute, we bring together Black and Indigenous scholars, artists, and cultural workers to build community with one another. We hold conversations, make art, eat, and talk about everything from sexuality, food ways, humor, land, ecologies, and more importantly, how to be in relationship with each other. 
as a scholar and now as one of many conveners and facilitators of black feminist and native feminist conversations, I and my colleagues struggle with representation or perhaps developing a practice and politics of representation. Our issues with representation are admittedly structured by the need and desire for a certain level of legibility. We have on the one hand succumbed to the institutional demands of making a mark or an intervention in helping to build a subfield called Black and Indigenous Feminist Studies. And building a subfield requires events and programming and publications and funding, certificates and courses. And we've made ourselves distinct. Um, we've made ourselves unique to a certain extent by commodifying our attempts to build the first black and indigenous studies certificate program in the South. We actually will be teaching our first class black and indigenous studies uh, this spring at UVA. So to an extent, our institution building needs to be visible and measurable. And on the other hand, we also want to um, hold space for the uh, black and indigenous feminist relationship building work that we do. So some of this relationship building work includes cultivating friendships and intimacies that the academy does not make space for or actually actively sabotages. So we want some of our relationship building to evade visibility. So the aspects of this relational labor that emerges ceremony, as care work, as holding secrets, um, some of the behind the scenes advocacy work and disrupting the rhythms and institutional flow of the university are things that we want to often elide or cover. So my colleagues and I share frustrations and straight up hot rage about the ways that the epistemic violence of the humanities, the social sciences, and the hard sciences extract from pornotrope and discipline black and indigenous communities. And we are keenly aware of scholars and disciplinary formations that attempt to prevent black and indigenous solidarity. And because of this epistemic and institutional violence, we struggle with representation, particularly visibility. But there are aspects of the relational work that we do at Beefy that we do want to mark the presence of and yet conceal. And I want the ceremonial, the uncommodifiable, the sacred, the impulse to burn it all down at times, to remain out of sight but still have a force. In Leslie Hewitt's four sculptures, the score for performance created with Jamal Cyrus housed at Bridgehampton, and her work in Rifts on Real Time have resonated with me around themes of bringing absented things, like the residue of historical moments into form. In her conversation with Eva Raspini, published by Osmos Books in 2018, Hewitt talked about how she came to her unique approach to sculpture and photography and image making. Remembering the death of her maternal grandmother, Hewitt talks about her impulse to visually record everything she thought she saw the first time she entered her grandmother's house after her transition. In conversation with Raspini, Hewitt recalls the following. My impulse to struggle through form most likely took root in my course of study while at the Cooper Union as it followed a generalist degree model. Image making, or if I may extend the phrase to image construction, conveys a physical or mental act of labor. That reminds me of a particular story from a much earlier age when I lost my maternal grandmother. I was with my mother when she found her. I was seven years old and was forced to stay outside her house in the garden. Eventually, without ever seeing her body, I entered the house with a bizarre impulse to visually record everything I think I saw as if I had a still and moving film camera. I had this intense sensation that nothing in her home would be the same and my memory would be where her home would live. The objects, small and large, their spatial relationships to each other and to the architecture of each room became a memory image. 
The schism between a physical experience, my memory, and the new objecthood of photography all began a more complex relationship in my mind. To answer one part of your question, my impulse is to try to give form to such absences. What are the parameters of such spaces? Could it have form? And I paused at your question, Leslie, could it have form? I paused and posed an additional question to myself about the work I am doing at this juncture in my career, and I asked myself a second question, should it have form? Should certain aspects of this work with black and indigenous life and freedom practices have form? And if so, what shape, feel, and force should they take? Later in your conversation with Raspini, you talk about legibility and different kinds of looking in relation to your work. In a portion of the conversation about riffs on real time, Raspini mark, remarks upon the ways that you obscure some objects and determine what the viewer of your pieces can or cannot read within your photographs. And Hewitt responds this way. Even in a space without obvious legibility, the desire for a clear answer doesn't fall away. There is something else in that space that holds you. You're still looking at something. What is that thing? What does it feel like? How does the photograph describe surface, time? Even if it's closed, the book has a material history. And this is what I appreciate, you say, there are other things we could pay attention to that put into context its relationship to significance. I understand that we have less patience for that kind of looking or that kind of experience. It requires more effort to stay committed. It isn't just receiving data or information as a form of consumption, it's a searching. I'm definitely interested in giving, vis giving a visual inscription, if you will, of that space. Hewitt's desire to keep people searching is what holds me in her response. The desire for lookers to pay attention to the other things that might provide context and significance. It's the honing of a patience, the cultivation of a kind of looking and an effort to stay committed. The way that Hewitt demands a reorientation to looking and perhaps knowing at the level of form is what compels me. It compels me to make shifts in my own orientation to her work. It also compels me to consider how I grapple with how to make something visible is in fact an epistemic and ethical question. And I want to deal explicitly with these representational, epistemic and ethical questions at the level of form. I think about Hewitt's appeal for searching in lieu of a mere consumption as an epistemology. And searching can be an orientation toward a relationship, as well as a way of attending to and knowing another a thing or even yourself. It is an epistemology that I think I and my colleagues have named in different ways at the Institute. I certainly have tried to approach this epistemology through meditations and ruminations on the value of opacity in my own scholarship. I tend to be attracted to forms, geographies, ecologies, movements, and activities that are shifty and hard to track. The shoal is certainly one. And I'm attracted to forms that sometimes disappear or belie form because they evade certain forms of capture and some of my draw, admittedly, is an homage to the praxis and tradition of fugitivity and a black feminist practice of refusal, but it's not solely or fully that. My search for an indeterminate and shifty form is also about cultivating a desire for a different kind of seeking. And I'm often searching for something at the level of form that creates a hunger for return but a return on different terms each time. Return, um, return perhaps is a new kind of subject. And I like the idea of eternal searches, right? The eternal search is often likened to a horizon, which is a metaphor that various revolutionary movements have animated and reanimated for their collective vision of a kind of radical struggle that is in a perpetual state of revision. And I appreciate that gesture and practice. 
I think about this development of desire for something else as a way of tempering a rapacious attention or interest in black and indigenous life that too easily becomes about objectification, turning into specimens, control, directing or obscuring, or to already know in advance what you need and want the black and indigenous figure to do for you. What if you could never capture that figure and could not direct its force? What does that look like at the level of form? So the next part of my talk, I make an attempt to think with some um, of, of Hewitt's work as well as some other forms that have helped me kind of think through this question. So form one, I came to a relationship with the medicine bundle this fall. My partner suggested that I wear one to better negotiate the thick spiritual energy or chaos on UVA's campus where I work. I find myself haunted by this particular 12-year-old girl every time I pass the memorial to enslaved laborers on campus. It's a lot of rage to hold. And there are many other thick spots on campus that I and my colleagues can feel. You never know when you'll register the chaos of conquest. And during our inaugural event at the Institute, we made medicine bundles during a creative workshop led by artist Marisa Williamson and Federico Cuatro Cuatro. Part protection, part making practice, a sinking of embodied rhythms as you stitch and sort herbs, we chose this ritual and aesthetic practice to create intimacy. Indigenous people in the Americas, indigenous people in Africa, and afro diasporan people make sacred bundles. Sacred bundles are forms of healing, ritual, and artistic practice. Cairo Malika Daniels studies sacred bundles in Haiti and ancient Congo, and the ways that they reveal the intersection of aesthetics, ritual, and curative work. In the 2013 article, The Undressing of Two Sacred Healing Bundles, Daniel argues that these sacred forms perform ritual work to mediate ruptures in the cosmos caused by human chaos. The form that our bundles took in Charlottesville seems straightforward. Two pieces of cloth or leather sewn together that hold the herbs and the medicine inside. Once stitched and sutured, the medicine is no longer visible. The protective cover hides a changing and dynamic process. You cannot see its transubstantiation, you can only see the protective cover. As a form, it is visible and of this realm, yet it also hides something and references another time space. The making of the medicine bundle at the Institute was also a collective and aesthetic ritualistic practice that you had to be invited into. And I am compelled to provide this type of cover for the relationship building work that happens between black and indigenous feminists. Cover for the ceremony, cover for the intimacy, cover for the desire to center black and indigenous people rather than settler desires and needs. And I think I idealize this form of the bundle right now for what it reveals and what it hides. Form two, Bay Whispers. During my visit to Hewitt's installation at Bridgehampton, I was informed about a lecture taking place on the Sunday of my visit at the John Germain Library at Sag Harbor. The Plain Sight Project hosted the event. The co-directors, Archivist Donna Marie Barnes and archaeologist David Ratray were presenting their findings on slavery on Long Island. Barnes, who was an archivist at Sylvester Manor on Shelter Island, talked about a 1657 court order in the archives of the Plymouth Colony Court. Catherine Hayes, an archaeologist who worked in an excavation site at Sylvester Manor, also references the same 1657 court documents in her 2011 article, Occulting the Past. The 1657 court order, which I have yet to actually locate in the digitized archives of the Plymouth Colony, accuses 
a wicked Indian and a mischievous Nagar woman servant of planning arson. The Plymouth Colony Court orders an account of the story in the surrounding island colonies, which included Massachusetts Bay, Connecticut, and Long Island before it became the English colony of New York, would have been local news for people on Shelter Island and the East Hampton communities on Long Island. The versions of this story, a wicked and mischievous Nagar woman servant, plan an act of arson, or as I heard it that day at John Germain Library, that an unnamed black woman paid three Indian men to burn her master's property, haunted the Sylvester Manor and Shelter Island communities. Hayes' article nor uh, Donna Marie Barnes's account indicate the exact location where the arson plot occurred. However, Hayes and Barnes bring the lore's location in proximity to Long Island. And I appreciate the way that hearsay turned rumor of black and indigenous insurrections can haunt a place or community. I'm fascinated by the way rumors, particularly ones thought to be unspeakable, can be spread throughout a community, shape shift and change over time and work as a source of inspiration or terror depending on the hearer. The rumors form is rather mercurial. They have an aesthetic and performative aspect of their own. Rumors are often whispered. They sometimes function as an aside to a formal address, only told in certain company, and then also on some level can be widely felt or known even if they are unspoken. And honestly, I live to track these kinds of black and native intimacies. In fact, I search for them in a way that has probably led me to develop some extractive reading practices. However, this impulse for certainty, proof, and extraction has been thwarted to some extent by the technology or the interface of the digital document themselves. My momentum has been slowed by the difficulties that I have had in locating um, the actual court order in the digital copy in the digital copies, and I've tried multiple search terms uh, in the search bar. So I tried wicked Indian, mischievous Nagar woman, both spellings with the U, with the V, wicked Indian and Nagar woman. And interestingly enough, um, Nagar never comes up. It could be a part of the processing, the way that both the University of Michigan and the University of California, San Diego, who contributed to the compendium that is the entire digital file, have organized algorithms, um, but it just doesn't come up that way. But as I've been stymied and slowed down in the search, I have had to become familiar with other things, other kinds of facts, data, and relationships. For instance, uh, perusing the court order surfaces a brutal regime of surveillance and punishment of people who transgress Puritan sexual codes and norms. Um, so there's evidence of a really sadistic Puritan regime of um, surveilling and policing people's intimacy. And in this particular court order, uh, there are two orders, one that focuses on the intimacy, sexual intimacy of an Indian male and a white woman named Mary who's married and a betrothed couple sexual practices. And so um, the punishment, particularly for Mary and Tint and the Indian are public whippings. Uh, Mary needs to actually wear a patch. If she's found without it, her face will be branded, right? So there's this particular order that I become aware of in 1657 when East Hampton is also conducting their own witch trials. And so some of these grisly uh, revelations just made me consider the other kinds of questions that I needed to ask and what else I needed to become curious about. And it also pressed on my desire to find black and indigenous solidarity. And I wondered about, you know, if I actually find the court document, what if it doesn't reveal what I desire or want? And a question that the scholar um, Sharon Holland posed to me is, what if you're reading Solidarity where there was 
perhaps just transaction at the moment. So this particular question is really important for me. I mean, can um, solidarity be transactional? And is transactional politics of exchange that can become solidarity? So these are really important political questions that I'm thinking about with my work. And right now, my own process, I'm left with a trace that I have not been able to locate at the moment. This trace, the rumor that cannot be verified, slows the process of knowing. It creates a generative opportunity to pause and reflect. Reflect on the whispers or the raucous laughter of the wicked Indian and mischievous nigger woman that seeped into the cracks of walls or the rocks or the ocean where they lived. What did the wood, stone, and waters around them absorb with the conversation? What do the boulders hold and sing of the arson plot? This wonder that the trace of the archive produces brings me back to Hewitt's sculptures and score at Dia. Hewitt's three bronze sculptures, untitled Basin, Hmm, Hum, or Him, untitled Bay Valley Rift, and untitled Shinnecock Bay Atlantic Sound, are located on the ground floor of the renovated two-story salt box building. I walk through two thresholds and down a few stairs to enter the exhibit space, where the first three sculptures of Meacock's Peconic and Shinnecock Bays rest on the floor. Hewitt, who attends to the force and rule of gravity, creates sculptures that often require the viewer to orient their gaze downward. The approximated outline or shoreline of the three East End Bays is recreated by the shiny bronze watery surface. The bronze watery surface and expanse of the bays is anchored by a brown matte boulder rendered by a 3D printer whose surface replicates the ocean floor. The points and surface are the rough brown boulder, of the rough brown boulder appear to make the deepest points of the ocean available to the eye. I walked around the sculpture several times to try and find an angle that allowed me a stabilizing image of the boulder in the bay. The stabilizing image that I probably wanted was a reflection of my face that could center me in my orientation to the representation of the bays and their depth. It is hard to get a glimpse of yourself. The surface picks up ceiling, windows, and other objects in the room. I found myself walking around the perimeter of the small exhibit space several times. I walked with my neck craned, I bent down. I could not get low enough to approach it at eye level. Mathilde Guidelli writes in the curatorial statement that Hewitt's work slows down perception in order to foster attunement. I never seem to be at the right angle for comprehend, um, comprehending any of the three structures in their entirety. As shapes themselves, they are deceptively simple morphologies and matter subject to the gravitational pull of the earth. However, the process of mapping using 2D bathmetric maps and then rendering the depth of the ocean floor with a 3D printer tells of a complex and layered process of surveying, mapping the colonial master codes, skepticism, interpretation, translation, mistranslation, a remix. Scales of time and space are gem, I'm sorry, um, and jammed at the site of each sculpture and in relation to one another. A locally sourced boulder from the island is installed behind the building on the grounds. This boulder and sculpture entitled Birthmark dons a bronze silhouette of a composite outline of all three bays. The reference to the shapes of the bays and thus the sculptures inside the building work to connect the inside and outside space at Dia. The locally sourced boulder pulls on the axes of the sculptures in the building, dispersing your attention omnidirectionally 
toward the ecology of the island where you stand and back toward the succession of bronze sculptures that echo the actual bays and ocean that produced this boulder. The echoing effect of the sculptures functions as a kind of repetition with a difference that alters your perception of space-time. A new entangled ecology comes into formation that connects the locally sourced boulders geological time and tectonic shifts to the technologies, maps, and temporalities that are reworked in the materiality of the bronze sculptures. Critics and scholars who have spent time with and written about Hewitt's work as a sculptor, photographer, film, and sound maker have called attention to themes of opacity in the case of Lisa Lee and heterotemporality when thinking with Nana Aduce Polko. In the book, Taking Stakes in the Unknown, Tracing Post-Black Art, Nana Duce Poco describes the way that Hewitt's composition and arrangements of her photography have been interpreted as sculpturally constructed. A part of this practice of sculptural construction is an elaborate process of layering. According to Duce Poco, Hewitt's practice of layering and riffs on real time inspires viewers to search for narrative or meaning between the objects and scenes depicted in the layers of images which are connected by the very fact that Hewitt has photographed them together. Aduce Poco also attends specifically to the way Hewitt reorganizes time to interrupt the normative gaze through a deferral of the gaze and enjoyment of deceleration. The liberal subject's notion of self bound to time and reflection are slowed, if not disrupted. I could not see myself and anchor the multiple meanings of the sculptures within the time space of my own human scale. Hewitt's spatial arrangements, repetitions, layering, and soundscapes create new relationships and associations that, in Aduce Poco's words, open up the notion of time and transposes the past, present, and future. Because Hewitt is also an activator of space through architectural interventions and practices of collective archiving as performed in the 2019 Reading Room series, it is possible to experience the compression, expansion, and overlays of palimpsestic time when in the presence of her work. I experienced the reverberations of heterotemporality that worked against the grain of colonial clock time through Hewitt's and Cyrus's collaboration to make the sonic echoes of the site and region audible to the human ear. The score that Hewitt and Cyrus created comes into being in relationship to the residue of the sound waves produced by the Black First Baptist congregation that occupied the building from 1923 to 1981. And these are photos I took of the um, material culture that was left uh, to Dan Flavin. As I listened to the score, I tried to attune my ears to what I thought were the sounds of ocean waves, singing, moaning, yelling, the stomping of feet, pops, static, and pauses. They were sounds from multiple times. Since the score inhabits the same space as the sculptures and their evocations of their kin, the boulder, I thought about the multiple vibrations and sound waves produced by the 20th century church congregation, the materials of the building, the boulder outside, and the geological and aquatic matter of the bays themselves. The boulders and bays are also noisemakers. Stotlow scholar Dylan Robinson's work, Hungry Listening, Resonant Theory for Indigenous Sound Studies, rethinks the sonic through indigenous practices of listening and music making. Rob Robinson um, acknowledges the capacity of limestone in Anishinaabe and the Haudenosaunee ancestral lands to speak, to sing, and produce sound. Thinking with the sonic alongside Hewitt, Cyrus, and Robinson made me consider that the echoes or the noise of the mischievous Nagar woman and wicked Indian arson plot might be registered through sonic echoes produced by the geology of bays. And that sound might be a better vehicle to carry the trace of the plot than a court transcript. 
Might the echo of the whispers over geological time create the kinds of sound waves that produce us as subjects oriented toward wonder, curiosity, and desire? Black and indigenous intimacies at times might be better registered in the form of centuries-old sound waves, rumors, and haunts that change shape and tenor over time. Echoes of the arson plot and fire as a creative process may be in the score that Hewitt, Cyrus, and the First Baptist Congregation, the Shinnecock Nation, and the Bays co-create. Listening for the sonic echoes of a wicked Indian, a mischievous Negro woman cackling, whispering, or perhaps singing works to reconfigure traditional archival practices. Normative archival practices often work to trap black and indigenous life. Hewitt's collective archiving and the use of sound to activate a space anew invite the boulders and bays into the shared space, the sacred space, I'm sorry, that was my slippage, the sacred space of the First Baptist Congregation. As congregants, the boulders and bays create an ancient and contemporary vibrational force that potentially carries the traces and resonances of the arson plot better than 17th century court documents. What are the forms that can reanimate the arson plot, the rumor, and the wicked Indian and mischievous Nagar woman's intimacy of rebellion? Um, thank you, Leslie, so much for the invitation to be in conversation with you. This is where my project drops off, so I look forward to thinking with you um, as I move through these spaces. And thank you for your attention. Appreciate it. Thank you, Tiffany. Thank you so much for agreeing to speak in this context, <laughs> to, um, to be inter interdisciplinary with me, um, and to hold space together here. So thank you. So, yeah, no, I should give some background because um, I often, when I start a new project, I need a grounding. And um, that could come, obviously, from visiting the site and having a relationship to a location. But I often um, look for scholarly writing that helps within the black radical tradition <laughs> um, to give language, to discursive language. I really respond heavily to that. I think it helps me imagine. It gives, uh, it concretizes um, in ways that are not um, physical, but it still concretizes. Um, and it shows a continuum. And so uh, reading the Black Shoals um, really made, it, it like filled so many, <laughs> Um, gaps for me and when it comes to um, location, especially in Long Island, um, because of the, I, I'd like to say the perceived entanglement of blackness and indigeneity that I've, uh, I'm someone who's from New York, I grew up in the area, not the area of Bridgehampton, but in, um, within Long Island um, and in Queens, there was always a haunting for me of that there was, there's just something there, either in um, looking at cemeteries, which we talked a little bit about, or the naming of certain locations, certain churches. Um, so there was always, uh, at least to me, a draw. And um, the confluence of the invitation from Dia, spending more time, literally, in the area, and encountering your research really gave me a great deal of courage to move in ways that um, I think are extremely abstract and perhaps opaque, um, but that there's a, um, an, a, I wanna say an eroticism there. There's a connection, there's a call, there's a discurs discursiveness. Um, there's also a critique and a, and a mode of refusal. And um, reading your text really helped me 
um, uh, you know, find, find a grounding and to create a clearing, if, to use a lot of words, <laughs> a lot of spatial terms here um, in the site of the installation. Um, so I wanted to, I guess the form I should say is I'm gonna, we're gonna be in a little conversation and then we're gonna open it up um, to others um, to, who may have more questions about your um, presentation as well. Um, but something that I think came up in your talk now um, that's definitely in your book um, is I think a desire to think about the shoal as a dis disrupting um, methodology and you call it shoaling in the book. Um, and I'm curious to hear you expand on that a little bit more and how it's still playing out in this new research as well. No, thank you. And I, I truly feel that you're a friend of mine, that we've been thinking about some of the same things without, um, well, certainly on my end, knowing about your work, but your ability is, um, Aduce Poco so eloquently describes in her own book to slow down perception and have people um, reattune themselves to something is actually an important kind of methodological strategy to me. Like that's why I valued the shoal so much. It disrupted a particular tradition or a pattern that I saw in the humanities and social sciences to capture and sequester black and indigenous life, to reroute it through a particular white settler tradition that didn't um, have at its heart the questions that um, were animating black and indigenous studies as fields, right? And kind of prevented the fields from coming together. So it was exactly the slowing process, what you do with repetition. And I think um, you are directing me to a conversation I think that you were having about the missing a beam of uh, this repetition of an image, but you disrupt that and you put a different image that disrupts um, a reproduction of an eternal white cis heteronormative subject. And like that slowing to help us attune to other possible things, other possible haunts, um, a vibration that you can feel to let you know that other intimacies are in the space, um, the kind of geological um, time that you experience through vibration on a mountain. We have Stone Mountain as a similar reference point. But that kind of slowing so you could pay attention to other things is something I was trying to achieve methodologically that you do in your, your own practice that once um, we came into a relationship, I'm like, oh no, I have to think with Leslie more and more and again and again. So um, I think we're moving like on a similar current or stream in that way, yeah. Yeah, and I, I'll add to that and just say like that was something that was very important. I think Mathilde knows this as well, why I, for my address of the building um, is also following a previous artist, Dan Flavin's address of the building. Um, and I wanted to move outside the building, you know, to be in the building, but also move outside of the building and not be bound or contained by its structure. And also that its history, or that um, the history of the site doesn't begin there. Um, and being able to kind of move laterally um, and also call up in a shared imagination the bays, which I, you know, you spoke a little bit about the terrain and trying to navigate it is difficult in our uh, contemporary <laughs> context. Um, so moving freely through private properties and other notions of who has what access to something that is and should be shared, um, you know, it, it, to have these kind of miniature but also large in scale in our ima shared ima historical imagination to kind of pull us out of the location. You know, so there's a lot of um, ways that I think shoaling, if I could use it here, um, happen in the context of the inst installation. Um, so uh, I have another question, which um, <laughs> connects to not necessarily uh, geography, but um, 
I actually have another question, but I'm going to get to that maybe a little bit later with the um, uh, ceremonial. But um, something that also really drew me um, in the book, but it, I think it's also in your um, impulse to go towards the archive or go, go towards court case and kind of be um, in confrontation with a way of framing a past. Um, I may be presuming the confrontation, but at first looking and trying to find. Um, and uh, your chapter, second chapter uh, in the Black Shoals where you are addressing DeBrom's map, and you use the term kind of um, critical black, uh, sorry, hold on. Critical black cartog. No, it's not gonna. Oh, critical black geographical reading. Um, and I see that as a counterpoint to the shoaling. Um, your use of that term. So I'm curious if you could speak more about it, and do you think it's also taking effect in this new research? So that's interesting. That takes me back to. I guess when I was getting feedback from multiple people, my own colleagues who are reading, and then the readers um, at Duke University Press, and was moving with the cartographic and the geographic to think about the kind of black critical attention um, I was trying to pay attention to in the map. And I was looking at the process of subject making, like various subjects who appear on the map, and how did that happen, right? And so you're right, the shoal doesn't function in the same way in that text, like the shoal. Um, for folks who are not familiar, the DeBrom map um, depicts in, what is it, 1757, the shoreline of the bottom of North Carolina, all of South Carolina, a portion of Georgia, and it has a cartouche which depicts um, three black ostensibly male figures making indigo, which is like floating in the ocean. There's a shoreline, um, which is populated with all the colonial names, right? So Charleston, the Savannah River, and then in, I guess, the western corner, if you looked at it on the page to the left, there's just this space that is kind of like an Anna space because it's there are all these paths from the Cherokee, right? Paths from the Catawba, right? So this space of indigeneity that is not a real space but a space to flee that doesn't have the same kind of markers of human civilization. And so that part of the human, the settler, the white colonial settler of the 18th century becomes the shoal or like the mediating space um, that has to protect whiteness from the chaos of the Anna space of uh, the Indian or the Cherokee, and then the watery kind of oceanic space of the black figures who are making indigo, right? So in that sense, um, the shoal is a space of violence, right? Um, but it is a buffering kind of space. So it is an ecotonal space between certain forms that are marked as um, chaos, non-human, other than human, and it is a kind of middle space, right? So the black critical geographic or cartographical tradition, its critical read was the violence of subject making that is happening in this in-between space of the shoal that I was trying to pay attention to, right? Because shoals can work in multiple ways, right? They're not always... Uh, these spaces of um, ideal uh, intimacy or interaction. So, and I also had to develop some other kinds of skill sets to read these bathmetric maps that um, you often bring into you bring into your own work with the bays. Right? They have their own kind of coding systems um, and language systems and rules that you have to read with and against. Right? So it was in that kind of critical black geographic reading practice, developing that skill set um, to render something, re-render it, question it, rethink it. So I think that's what I was trying to work out. Mm 
in that chapter. I yeah. love that chapter. I read it. <laughs> yeah, it's spooky. It every other day. <laughs> weird haunty things in it. Yeah. No, it's really, so. really good. And I think um, on so many levels, but I think maybe as a visual, as, a, as an artist who works in this liminal space between sculpture and photography, I see so many parallels. We're talking about different things, obviously, but there's something in that process of mediation or transformation um, that I rest my work in um, and that it is this moment of formulation, but it's, it's formulating in my mind um, in community. So it's, uh, the, the resist in my work is not to have a finished object in and of itself that a viewer looks or gazes upon, but it's asking for a criticality or kind of resurfacing or asking for a kind of question to be formed. Um, so that chapter, I love it. It's just so rich. Um, it's rich for what you are um, kind of repositioning, I think, our gaze um, to be comfortable with entanglements and that they're not always meant to be disentangled. And um, if I could, you know, be concise for a moment, I feel like reading The Black Shoals is being, being in that space constantly. Um, and how it changes our perception. Yeah. No, thank you for that. And also, you helped me think about that particular place of the shoal that is made. It, it's a place that you're trying to configure this white settler human between um, land, wilderness, and the ocean, right? Marked as native and indigenous, but it's unstable, right? It's a place that has failed, right? And you continue to try to engage this process of violence. And it's an anxious space that's never complete. So that incompletion and that failure is also a place that I'm deeply attracted to as well, right? Like what are the processes that are trying to come into form that can't? Because of a number of things, like black and indigenous resistance, right? To the stabilized subject, but other things like technology or my own, um, lack of uh, particular kind of digital literacy skills. Like I have to go back and spend time with black, uh, black women historians in particular, black feminist historians specifically, who work with digital archives. <coughs> Excuse me. And just talk about the ways that the digital has reconfigured the archive that we generally have thought about something you go and visit, right? And there are all these new reading strategies, right? That sometimes fail, that we have to confront or contend with, too. Mm -hmm. um, the last question, I think, before maybe we open it up, and you don't have to answer in detail, but I loved the um, medicine form or thinking about medicinal practices as it relates to um, touch and also closeness and proximity and intimacy, like you wear, I mean, you, you showed an image where it was placed on something, but ultimately it's meant to be in close proximity with, with your body. Um, and um, yeah, I'm just curious to know a little bit more about how that, and that was your form one. Um, do you see that because I guess I have an affinity to that. I mean, I think as an artist, ultimately, this thinking about um, balms and thinking about, um, I guess, the kind of, um, maybe we call it an aesthetic or a sublime, like searching for some other quality that um, comes through the experience of making art. I don't know if that's always akin to viewing art, but definitely in the making. And it, you can never really give a voice to it, I'd like to say. But just seeing you kind of point to that um, and the beauty of seeing it also in line with the bays and with, this, with the sculpture of my um, sculptural act um, is really, really intriguing. And I'm curious how that comes into your writing practice or thinking critically. Like, not that that isn't in and of itself that, but um, in my mind, it, it goes into thinking about ways of knowing um, that you just generously, I think, in your writing bring into um, the academic 
uh, space. So other ways of knowing. Yeah. No, thank you for thinking about it in that way. I know that that form comes about, the medicine bundle, um, do in part just to necessity. Like, I don't know. You said that you've been to UVA, to that particular space, the academical grounds in Charlottesville. I don't know if other people have experienced it, but it is a really, really heavy space for me. And so similarly it was for our Casey Jernigan and, and Sonia Alcanini, who are the co-directors as well, who are um, indigenous scholars and anthropologists who work in a building called Brooks Hall that they are sure um, has the uh, holds the bones and remains of enslaved people, right? So it's something that they have to encounter um, and be in a space of mourning and ceremony about all the time. And we were just, we're like, we need the particular kind of resources and protection. So yes, we made those things for ourselves to have on campus, but also use them as a kind of ritual to get to know each other and the fellows who came in that particular week who were Jody Bird and Sharon Hall and of course did it uh, with with direction from Federico and Marisa and you know that making process also helped me slow down and pay attention to my body and how I was approaching, and I didn't have the language of how I was thinking about this form at the time, but what does this making practice do for our relationships at the Institute, but also it's developing a kind of epistemology or a way of paying attention to each other, each other's bodies, each other's breath, and think very carefully about the kind of opportunities we would create for people to gather, the kinds of classes we would teach, what we would publish, what we would not, right? So it also helped us reorient us to our own fields. What kinds of questions do we respectively ask as black scholars about indigenous people? And what do indigenous scholars often think or assume about black people that we have to spend some time with, right? And so it slowed down our own process of productivity as scholars. It helped us reorient ourselves to each other and these field formations that we have to contribute to, right? So it became a deep uh, epistemological question. How do, have we gone about knowing each other, producing knowledge about each other, and what do we need to change about that process? at a deep embodied level, because we, we both experience, we all experience a particular kind of undoing and unmooring at this, these academical grounds, which are very violent, right? So I don't know <laughs> if I got to any of your inquiries, but all of those things about being with each other and ways of knowing and thinking and producing objects, art, scholarship, or, um, wrapped up in like, how do we be together? And actually this pr making practice, it changes some stuff for us. Yeah, it really does. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hi, thank you both for this. It's good to see you both. Um, I'm just wondering if you can both riff some more on form. I know it's a huge question and, and one that you both have already demonstrated incredible attention to. But I'm curious, Tiffany, did I hear you say shifty form at some point in your talk, which I love? Can you say some more? But also those things that can't, not just those things that can't take form, but shouldn't, as you introduced, Tiffany, shouldn't take form. And, and, and also then in relationship to form, what, are, what is your thinking, your calculus, in deciding which things should not appear, should not be, for those beyond yourself, beyond your small community, beyond your intended. I'm scared of the form question. I still feel like an amateur. But the shiftiness is, I think some of the things that you were talking about, Leslie, so beautifully, like the things that like almost appear sometimes like in the like right at the edge of making an appearance that you can feel it's perhaps a haunt, like what you experience in Long Island, like I know it's there, right? 
And it's something about, yeah, the hunch, right? The, the way the wind hits you. Like there's some history, experience, information there that allows you to tap into it, but in a different way, in a way that's not about capture, but perhaps moving with it, which I think is productive for some things. So I think it's productive in um, some of the like the clandestine things that I and my co-directors have had to do just for our own survival <laughs> at the university, like the ways that we gather, the things that we gather about, the dinners that we have that'll never show up in particular reports, right? Uh, the ways that we um, decide to show up for students, not participate in some things. I think those are the things that we only bring to like a certain kind of critical point of materializing and then we just leave them, right? But then there are other things where you have to put on the record a course or you have to develop a particular resolution or a stance about something. You have to be visible in a particular way to um, assert some politics that are attached to an ideology. So that is also um, done in relationship. It's done over conversations, right? It's a negotiation. It's decided um, in relation to very specific things and issues that need to be handled, right? So whether something should come into writing, um, a statement should be made or something doesn't need to be distributed on the listserv and we just need to spend time thinking about it, laughing about it, making more medicine bundles or talking shit or you know those other things, right? That's the place of where, yeah, we don't want you to see the trace of the outline or the form of it. Um, but please say more about Thank <laughs> form. Thank you for that question too because I think um, I struggle with form. I mean, I think, I hope that struggle then produces something, be something beautiful in that process. Um, I often think in terms of a temporality that the work unfolds and make and hopefully continues to unfold. So it's always unfolding and opening up. Um, so uh, what I try to do or think about is pack as much, almost like the medicine bundle, pack as much detail and specificity into it, almost to the point where it's unrecognizable, but maybe in a future, an aspect of it will become clear. And um, I think a lot about this in relationship to um, some people call the blues epistemology or the blues aesthetic, and that a lot of the African-American narrative is in a sonic sphere, which is also your research, <laughs> Shana. And, um, that certain sounds and calls and you know all those things are um, descriptive. And even if they're not um, words that we can clearly, right, kind of uh, extract a narrative from, they tell us something. Um, and so even though when I'm working with sculpture or photography, that aspect of being an understanding form doesn't completely leave or dissipate, but I'm trying to translate it into another, um, a new form. Um, so I think with that is embedded a kind of um, silence at times, a uh, kind of roar or a loudness at other times, um, and all of that is dependent on environment and um, where we are to, in a collective sense, I think. Tiffany, I'm just stuck in this uh, thought of this missing information mm -hmm. that you can't find in these court documents um, regarding <laughs> is that something you're still in search of? And in inquiring that information, what for what purposes do you need to like really gather that additional information? Um, I feel like certainly Catherine Hayes and um, Donna Marie Barnes 
probably put their finger on that document. I was just trying to uh, explain where I am in the process and that I have not yet um, located the exact page, even though I'm given a page by um, Catherine Hayes that it should be on 180, but when I go there in the digitized version, which the pagination might be off for some reason, just the way they processed it and digitized it, like when you go even search for page 180, it's not there. So I literally could ask both of them via email tomorrow, and they could probably be like, well, actually, this is how you do it. But I just got caught up in like my own failure, and I was like, well, what's generative about that? And that, oh, I didn't know that this um, 1657 witch trial was going on in East Hampton, and I didn't know that all of these people were literally being brutalized and disfigured for their own particularly practices of intimacy that um, went against these puritanical codes. And I'm like, oh, there are all these other things that I could also know. And that's what struck me in your conversation with Eva, right? It's like, well, no, there are these other things too that I want you to consider. This place is jam-packed with all of these questions. And it was challenging me on my impulse to find my idealized version of what black and indigenous solidarity should look like. And then it surfaced all these questions around my desire for that. And so that question that I think Sharon Holland was asking about, well, what if it's just transactional? And like, they, it was just a thing for that moment. And like, what are you investing in this moment? So it just helped me kind of move out and think about what my own desires were. But I feel like I will actually be able to find the document. Um, but I just wanted to pause and think about how I was approaching it, right? Thinking about what I wanted to know, when I wanted to know, what I wanted to look like, which um, I think is something we're trying to do at the Institute with like thinking about how to approach Black and Indigenous studies. Like what investments do you come to it with? So yeah, so like that's where I am in the process and that's what it was kind of bring it up for me. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Matilda. Thank you so much. This has been really quite, there's a lot to think about. <laughs> you put so much out there. One thing I just wondered if you could expand a little bit on, and I think it was already asked, is this question of what is not to be visualized? Or what, I, I suppose it's a, a maybe two part of what can't be visualized and therefore it shouldn't be visualized. But I wonder if you could expand a little bit more on that um, topic. Uh, maybe I'll be more specific about this particular project. Um, I think there are just things that we don't know, right, about the location that were not archived, but it didn't mean that those things didn't happen. And how do you leave space for that? that unknowable, <laughs> knowable. <laughs> um, and I find the, that to be very uh, palpable in the site of the Dia Bridgehampton, partly because of all of the details of the past that are left in the architecture of the building. Um, also, Flavin's um, reinterpretation of, I mean, it was also a firehouse. We didn't talk about that, but even the arson thing was making me, my brain swirl a little bit with that. But, um, you know, there's a constant um, reminder of things that are not in your present tense or not a part of the present tense. Um, and they can't be. Um, and I think this notion of um, immediacy is something I think very much of our shared contemporary consciousness um, and the kind of acceleration of imagery and information that we can't possibly even process, but we still have this expectation of it. Um, so I think for, for, for me, sh structurally, I'm always interested in creating a clearing, number one, like how to create more space, um, even space that we, um, uh, isn't clearly defined by, um, I said this earlier, but architectonic logics or even spatial logics of where something ends and where something um, begins. And to me, being that um, porous hopefully sets up a kind of echo 
where it's, it sets a, a new, uh, or another way to position yourself. Um, and that then includes things that aren't pictured or aren't uh, described explicitly, but you have an awareness, almost like a, you know, your peripheral vision, right? We don't util utilize it in the same way as our direct vision, but we need it to have a sense of space, spatiality, atmosphere. Um, so for me, I, I think um, I utilize that in art, we call it sometimes the negative space, <laughs> but the, that other kind of spatial awareness, most of my mode of making form includes hinting at its presence or its um, space or its uh, um, importance to how um, we navigate. So I, that's one way that I wanted to, to describe it. But I think the other thing could be when you are aware of something and whether or not it is the best um, setting for its revealing. And um, that's, a, I think, a different uh, conversation. That's not something that I feel like I enacted for this um, project, but it is something that definitely in my leaning works and riffs on real time that I am actively definitely doing that kind of um, turning or refusal, active refusal. Um, so <laughs> I want to sit in that <laughs> offering. Yeah. Well, thank you. I'm going to thank Leslie and thank Tiffany so much for your time, generosity, attentiveness, and thinking through form with us. Um, Shana kind of got to the core of a question I wanted to ask similarly. Um, it was wonderful to hear think through form, um, given that you, again, as I said, your writing really performs uh, that attention to um, form all the time. And uh, it's a pleasure because not only um, attains uh, our rational brain, but completely involves us bodily, as Leslie was saying, this surfacing is always present. So thank you so much. Thank you all for coming. And thank you. Uh, yeah.